Welcome to the second lecture on invariant state estimation. We covered the derivations and some examples of invariant extended Kalman filter in the last lecture. We want to continue our conversation on more examples, but a very interesting sensor called IMU, Inertial Measurement Unit. We want to see how we can model this and how it fits into this invariant state estimation framework. In the previous lecture, we gave an example of a right invariant EKF for a robot that was moving and observing some landmarks. This time, I will give you an example of a left invariant EKF, which will use the IMU for prediction or propagation and a GPS for correction. And then you will see an, another example of a sensor that fits into the invariant observation model. And then it will make more sense to you why we call them left or right. That's just uh, because it makes sense when we write down the observation model, that's a natural way to talk about the innovations and then manage the order of multiplications in derivations of the error update equation. So I will be writing down, but we get back to the slides in the end. So the sensor we want to model is called inertial measurement unit, IMU. So that was the picture of it. It's a small sensor. You have it in your smartphone as well. There are many variations of it, but at the very basic form of it, it comes with a gyroscope. A gyroscope measures the rate of rotation in the sensor frame, in the frame that is attached to the sensor, and a linear accelerometer. The linear accelerometer measures the linear acceleration, the movement of, again, the sensor, the frame that is attached to the sensor. Now, how, how we build these sensors, that's just a topic of mechatronics, sensor design, that's very important. Better sensors enable better algorithms and performance, but that's not what we want to talk about. We want to talk about mathematical modeling and algorithms that will use that sensor. And typically, the sensor has a better, if the sensor has a better accuracy, it will be more expensive, as you expect. The one that you have in your phone is probably cheap because they want to mass produce, and it doesn't make sense to put an IMU that costs $100,000 into a phone. But maybe for a spaceship, it makes sense, because we don't want to lose the ship, right? So we have a gyroscope and accelerometer. It can come with a magnetometer that measures the local magnetic field of whatever place you are. If you do have a magnetic map of the planet, then you can use it as a reference and have a fixed reference system that's called north, east, down sometimes. If we know the magnetic field of the Earth, then we can basically have a global referencing system. That's very challenging to use indoor because all the structures and all the devices that we have will change that field. But typically, if you're outdoor, it is good. And that can be used to provide a reference. Otherwise, your heading is always unobservable. Sometimes the sensor also comes with a barometer that measures the pressure. Right? We won't talk about magnetometer and barometer. We talk about the gyroscope and the accelerometer. So the state variables are Rotation, 
which is an element of SO3. It's a rotation matrix. We have velocity. This is a linear velocity of the sensor. If the sensor is attached to the robot rigidly, of course, it's also the velocity of the robot in the sensor frame with respect to some frame that we will define. Then we have position. which is also a three vector. You can put everything into a tuple or tuple, and then call it state tuple. Why tuple? If you want to be really picky with the notation, sometimes you see people use set notation. Set doesn't have order. Tuple, you can arrange objects like rotation and vector, because we can't put them in a vector, obviously. Rotation is a matrix. But there is a mathematical notation for it, and that's the tuple. Tuple preserves the order of the objects. A set does not preserve the order. But it's, it is understood if you write it as a set as well. But this is the better way to write it. So this is our state for using this sensor. I have a quick question. Does it matter um, where, where does preserving the order come in? Where is it important for relevance to preserve the order? So the question is, does it matter if we put P first or V first. It doesn't matter, but once you choose an order in the columns of matrices that we will write down, you can't change it halfway through. The column and filter will just break down if you arbitrarily change order. So fix the, the convention you prefer and then stick to it. Don't change it after that. What are the inputs or measurements? So we have angular velocity This is, again, a three vector of rate of rotation about body fixed frame, but you can also talk about a skew-symmetric matrix that is in the Lie algebra of SO3. And then we have linear acceleration. which is the linear acceleration in the body fixed frame measured by the sensor. These are signals that we directly read from the sensor. Physics will give us this as the sensor operates. Now we may define A vector of inputs by just a stacking angular velocity and linear acceleration. And this will be obviously a six vector. So U is. directly measured by an IMU, 
And maybe it's important to point out that it's measured by an IMU in the body frame. Now, why we need to include the velocity? You might have this question. Can't we just include the rotation and position? Is that possible? Not if we want to have a first order ODE. Do you mean because the acceleration is the second order, a second derivative of the position? If you want to have a cascade integration of these first order differential equations, we need to include uh, exactly, like you said, all the derivatives up to one before the input then we can have this cascade of integration. So the sensor is giving us the acceleration. One integration should give us the velocity. Another integration will give us the position. So naturally, the velocity shows up here, right? It's, it's because the sensor is giving, measuring the second derivative of the position. Luckily, the gyroscope is measuring the first derivative of the rotation. It is not angular acceleration. Why luckily? Clearly not because we don't like math, right? <laughs> to the thing that you actually want, mm -hmm. you're going to get a more exciting result. Exactly. Very good point. So because now we're talking about a perfect situation, no noise, deterministic model, to understand the property of this process, then we will add noise. Then we have to talk about what will happen and what should we do when we have biases. Because, for example, the axis of your accelerometer, they're not perfectly perpendicular due to manufacturing errors. The thermal noise can affect the sensor performance, or it can expand, right? You can have different level of a strain. It's not perfectly in the laboratory situation that they tested and reported the noise parameters. All of these many unknown factors that can cause error and we are not modeling them because our model is capturing the essence of it, but not all the little intricacy that exists in nature. The more you integrate a signal, the more you accumulate, the faster you accumulate error. So if you have to integrate one time, that's much better than integrating twice. So quadratically, you will uh, grow the error if you integrate twice, and that's, so the error can grow exponentially if you integrate more times. So we do like to have measurements that are directly close to the state, but we are also limited by what's, what we know and what we can build to work with the physics of the problem, okay? And that's one of the big challenges of IMU. You get acceleration, you have to integrate twice, the position will drift significantly. So that brings us to the question that what is the best way to model this sensor? Spoiler alert, there's a Lee group that will model that. Let's talk about a somewhat exotic matrix Lie group. Uh, 
This is similar to SE3, but we will add more vector spaces. We will add velocity and position. Now, you can have two positions, three positions, depending on what you do. So you can have as many vector spaces as you want. We will work with two. This group is called the group of double direct isometries of the Euclidean space, here three-dimensional Euclidean space. Because if you remember, rigid body motion was the isometry of the 3D space. An isometry was a transformation that would preserve distance, distance between two points, any two points. So because we have two columns now related to the translational part, we call it the group of double direct isometries. So this is a group of double direct isometries of R3. What is the dimension of this group? Is the dimension is the dimension of its Lie algebra, as we will see now, it's nine. Three for rotation, three for translation, and three for velocity. So matrices in this group, they look like this. You have rotation, velocity, and position. We have rows of one by three zeros. We get one, zero, zero, one. It doesn't matter if you like to put position first or velocity. Again, you can choose and just stick to it. This is an element of SE3. Using what SE23, or however you want to read it. There's no short, pretty name for this, whatever you want to call it. And we can add more columns. You have to grow the dimension of this matrix. Now it's five by five. If you add one more for any reason, for example, for legged robot, we add contact points. So you can add more columns. This will grow. If you add one more, it will be six by six. Two because this two is related to one, two. SE3 has only one translational column, a vector space. This one has two. It's hard to come up with a better notation. I think that's probably the most compact notation. And three is for R3. So the Lie algebra of this group is the space of vectors, you can think about it as a generalized version of twist. So we might abuse the terms that we use and we just call it twist sometimes. But from the context, you know that it's not just position and rotation. Again, we choose our, our order, which first one is something like omega as usual for rotation, this will be for velocity, and this will be for position. This is a nine vector. So we have rotation, 
Now, depending what you're doing and you're talking about the continuous time or discrete time, you need to be obviously careful about the meaning of it. This vector can be angular velocity, but if you're working with a discrete model and it's angular velocity time, times delta t, then it's a delta angle. Similarly, for velocity, it can have an acceleration meaning, but if it's a discrete model, it's acceleration times delta t, it's like a delta velocity, okay? But in the continuous time version, it is the derivative of the quantity you see in the state matrix. Now, one nice reason to work with this group is that you can check, it will satisfy all the properties of matrix Lie groups. Everything we talked about, we established, will be true. You can just use whatever we did, that differential equation, that is first order propagation. We, will, we won't work with that equation, but that holds. And everything we talked about for matrix Lie groups, it is true for this group as well. Now the wedge notation, we need to define another overloaded notation, but that should not be a source of confusion because this is a nine vector. When you code it, it's not a six vector, so it will never be the same input. We have the skew-symmetric part for the rotation. Then we have the velocity part. And then we have the position part. And then we get all zeros. You could call this the Lie algebra of this SE23. So you can visually verify, it's very similar to SE3. Whatever you expect to see, you can see here, it's just growing based on the extra vector space. And similar to all other Lie groups, we have the fact that for every element of this group, there is an element in the Lie algebra that when, that when you take the exponential, matrix exponential of that, it corresponds to a group element. What about the adjoint map? Now we derived the adjoint map for SO3 and SE3. You can follow the exact same process. A little more calculation, you can derive the adjoint matrix for this group. If you do that, it will look like this. Now the adjoint depends on the order of angular velocity, position, velocity, right? So based on the order that I chose, the matrix will look like this. The diagonal is all rotation. You get velocity skew times r. Then we have position skew times r. Then we have zero. And then we have rotation. So the adjoint is a nine by nine matrix. It belongs to nine by nine matrices. The meaning of the adjoint, what it does for us, everything is the same. We wanna map this twist or generalized version of the velocity from one point to another point. Maybe we want to map the covariance Everything we did, we can just use the adjoint map. In fact, if you want to propagate that covariance for that odometry, if the motion is in this group, you use the exact same equation. You will not change anything. You don't need to derive it. So all the derivations are general already and valid. So you, you can, now you start seeing that why this is convenient, because you do not need to redo derivations and calculations for new problems. And eventually this could be just a library that you, can't even, you don't even need to look into it. 
it will do it for you, right? So now that we have a matrix Lie group to define our state to be an element of that group, now we can talk about the process model. Now I want to talk about the continuous time IMU process model. I'm going to first write it without matrices, then we will arrange it into a matrix. We know already for a gyroscope that the derivative of the rotation matrix, you could call it R dot, is rotation times discrete-symmetric matrix of angular velocities. And I, I'm using now the subscript T because I want to emphasize that these variables are evolving with time. And the input that we read from the gyroscope is also variable with time. What about the velocity term? We can talk about that the time derivative of the velocity By the way, I am talking about rotation, position, and velocity of the sensor with respect to a world frame. So I'm tracking the sensor pose and velocity with respect to a fixed world or global frame that you can choose where it is. Initially, it can be where you start, then you want to track with respect to that frame. So this rotation is a rotation that will transform a vector or a point in the body frame to the world frame, okay? And for the velocity, it is possible to talk about the velocity of a body frame in the body frame or the velocity of the body frame in the world frame. It matters which frame of reference we talk about the velocity. The observer frame is important. So the time derivative of the velocity in the world, a velocity of the body frame with respect to the world frame is, you can call it V dot. To do that, we need to rotate the acceler acceleration that we read to be aligned with the global frame. And then we need to compensate the gravity because the IMU the accelerometer that we have in the IMU will return a measurement that measures the gravity. If you leave your IMU on the desk, it will not return zero, 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 even if it's perfectly aligned. In an ideal case, it will give you zero, zero, and some acceleration for the gravity, right? And the acceleration that the IMU senses, it will be positive. It thinks that the sensor is moving up. Because the gravity is pulling the sensor down, the reaction to, uh, the reaction to that force is going up. So physically, the sensor is thinking that a force is moving the sensor up, the, the reaction of that. So that's why you read a positive value if the z is up in your frame of reference. Then we include a negative value for the gravity to zero out that gravity term. So you can subtract z then, is that true? Well, it depends. You can, if g is 
0, 0, negative of some value you can still add. So it's, when you actually implement it, you need to be careful. But plus, minus, it doesn't matter. It depends how you define the gravity. It's a constant vector. If the sensor is upside down, it will change the sign. But because we also track the orientation of the sensor, we rotate it back. So in the equation, we rotate back to be aligned with the global frame that we want to track uh, with respect to it. Right? That, that's, the pro that's exactly the problem, right? The sensor can move in all sorts of configuration, and that's going to be a nightmare if we don't know how it's oriented with respect to the global frame. So knowing this rotation is very important. Otherwise, you cannot compensate the gravity. It will be always there. And we cannot integrate gravi the gravity because the sensor is sitting here. You integrate. And you will be moving super fast with this amount of acceleration, whereas you expect to get zero. We, I'll, I'll write it down. Okay. I'll write it down in a bit. Before I write down what they mean, we have also the derivative of the position, which is simply the velocity. So the time derivative of the position in the um, position of the sensor with respect to a world frame is just the velocity. And then the derivative of the velocity, because it's acceleration, it gets coupled with, the, with what we read from the sensor. So R, V, and P are rotation. velocity and position of the body frame or IMU frame with respect to the world frame. So that means I may fix a world frame and then I can move in any way that I want. I want to integrate this model to know the orientation, the velocity, and position of the sensor in the world frame. That's my observing frame. You can, of course, talk about uh, the body velocity of the IMU in, in the body frame. That's possible. You can talk about the rotation of the world frame as seen in the body frame. So that depends on the problem and what we want to do. But a typical standard convention in robotics is track your sensor or robot with respect to some fixed frame. And again, I understand in aerospace, they usually track 
um, the rotation of the world in the body frame. So this inverse of that. But that's not a problem. You can just define the state to be transpose of the rotation and then work with drive a filter that works with that. That's not a problem, okay? Now let's put this in a matrix. We have three equations that describes the time evolution of our state variables. These are first order differential equations. So let x at time t be r t, v t, and p t in a matrix. And I'm, I'm not writing anymore, this is one by three. It's understood. If that's the rotation, you just need to fill in with zeros in a way that makes sense. This is an element of SE2, three. Then the time derivative of x Take the element wise derivative of this matrix, right? For rotation, you have r dot. For v, you have v dot. For p, you have p dot. Now we know the equation from the above, substitute it into the matrix, and we get this relationship. And the time derivative of constant values, those ones, is obviously zero. So I'm, I'm just substituting the equations from above into the matrix. Now we can define this matrix to be our deterministic process model. This is a process model on Lie group. It is not like what we had before, this, is, this one is the simplest way you can get. It's the kinematic model that naturally comes with any Lie group. In a sense, it's a constant velocity model native to each Lie group. For, this does not describe the IMU because the rotation part it does. The velocity part it doesn't because the IMU part of the acceleration need, needs to be compensated with the gravity. So there was a question on chat that why this twist is a nine vector. I'm not sure if you got your answer, but I repeat that. The twist now, it's a nine vector because the group has nine dimension. We want to track position, velocity, and rotation. In 3D space, rotation has three dimensions. Velocity, we have three axes. We have three dimension for the velocity, and we have three dimension for the position. If you stack them into a vector, in the Lie algebra, that will give you a nine vector. That's why this is nine by one. So this doesn't describe an IMU. It is true, but it doesn't describe the IMU. Okay? 
Now, what is interesting is that, and that's your exercise, to plug in into the group affine property, what you will observe is that this process model satisfies the group affine property. And the group affine property was this property here. All you need to do, you need to calculate direct calculation, perform the direct calculation of both sides and show that they are the same. Then you know it is group affine, and then you have the exact equation for the error dynamics. And at that time, you know that you can derive a log linear error dynamics. That was theorem two. Now, this is surprising because why? You're not amused that IMU has a log linear error dynamics. That means that we can, in a deterministic case, if you want to propagate the covariance, you can do it exactly, despite the fact that this model is nonlinear. Right? This is not a, I'm afraid it won't be recorded again, so I'm going to remove it. You know what happened? I touched something that was working properly and then it stopped working. That's the first rule of engineering. Do not touch something that is working. It will stop working and you cannot fix it. <laughs> so that's the lesson from today. And besides that, the IMU is also log linear. Now, I hate to tell you that in the literature, they will tell you this is nonlinear, you can't do it, you have to linearize. It's messy. Probably in other courses you will take, they'll tell you this is nonlinear. And now you know that's just not true. Now, I do not recommend getting physical, but know that what you hear is not the full story. There is a choice of coordinates that will make the error propagation exact. And this is the log linear property using this theorem in the deterministic case, right? Then we will have introduced noise and bias terms. The theoretical results are lost, but it's still it's better than not using it. It works very well in practice. So this means we can integrate the IMU dynamics exactly. No approximation. And if you have a covariance, second order error, uncertainty, we can propagate that exactly as well. So this process model satisfies remark. You can verify that. The process model, or better to say, the deterministic and F subscript U, just to emphasize, there is some, there's an input somewhere. You can't drop it, that it doesn't matter. We're just emphasizing that there is an input to this process. 
satisfies the group affine property. So if that's the case, with everything we learned, the first thing you want to do is to derive the log linear error dynamics. And that will be the A matrix. Because if you remember, for the implementing the invariant extended column filter, we need a process model that satisfies the group affine property. And then we derive the log linear error dynamics matrix A. And then we need a measurement model that fits into one of the left or right invariant models. From that model, we derive the measurement Jacobian H matrix. Then we know everything to implement it. And if you have a library that is already taking them as the input, as input, then you're done at that point. You can just run your filter. So four elements. And given the model, your job is only to derive two matrices. Then you know everything. And possibly tuning noise, of course. On the last page, you wrote um, a short differential equation that does not represent an IMU. Yeah. So for Lee group SO3, so the question is, why did I write this? I could just not say it. Sometimes we say more, and then we're in trouble. So <laughs> now I'm trying to answer the question because I wrote too much. So for Lee groups SO3, you, you would just write, where should I write? For Lie group SO3, you would just write R dot equals R omega is cubed. Now, R is entirely the group element, and omega is the element of the Lie algebra, and this differential equation comes with the Lie group directly. For SE3, this is SO3, this is SE3. We could also write this in this form, and we used it for the constant velocity motion model in the robot localization example. Now, you might think that it's always going to be like that. Therefore, for this group, we also write this, and then we call it a day. But no, that's not the case. This is just the simplest process model that comes with the Lie group. It is the constant velocity model. Because if we assume this twist is constant over a delta t, and we're just integrating that. However, IMU is giving us second derivative of the position. Then there's that gravity. So the model ends up being different. We cannot work with this model directly. So it's a little bit more complicated. Now, the processes on Lie group can be as complicated as you want. It can be so nonlinear that it doesn't satisfy group affine property, and we don't get anything nice from them. But fortunately for this sensor, it does satisfy. So it gives you hope. There are a lot of things in nature that are nice. We just need to look at them from the right lens, in a sense. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. you have a question? Yes, I was just saying, um, so from before, you were saying that you know, in the literature, you wouldn't necessarily find you know, something that says that, oh, you can handle IMUs completely in this way. So does that mean that? Um, that this way of modeling IMU is was only fairly recently explored? Yeah, so the point is, uh, you're asking that why the collective wisdom of the literature is not emphasizing that you can integrate this exactly. Yeah. 
By that, I mean the majority of them, especially if they're older than 2017, 16, 15. You don't see that. And after that, it takes a while until people adopt it. So there's a small body of literature they do use the model. But it takes a while until everybody adopts it. It is because exactly it's new. So then we want to talk about log linear, maybe first right invariant error dynamics. So we expect, after writing the linear aerodynamics, that the first theorem provides the structure of it, and linearizing it, we expect to get a matrix that describes the evolution of the error in the Lie algebra. Now, we do not need to start every time from scratch. We are after. this matrix. So we'll have to write down the aerodynamics and then do the first order approximation of the exponential map, drop the old, order, all the higher order terms, and what we will, will be left is this matrix. You can do it for the right error, or you can do it for the left. Each one will give you a different matrix. So the right matrix will be like this. I skipped the calculation. This is something, it is available in references that I will point out in the end. You can look into that but it's good for you to carry out the calculation. It is just direct calculation. What you will get is surprisingly a constant matrix, which as it was promised by the theorem, the error evolution given an initial condition from this, for this ODE, it is independent of your state estimate. So the matrix A does not depend on the estimate of R, P, or V. It is constant. Hence, the error propagation, given an initial condition, is exact. This is 9 by 9. And you can derive the left invariant but the equation is similar but you will get a different a matrix because we start from a left invariant definition of the error in the group. That will lead to another matrix that we use superscript R and L to emphasize this is for left and right invariant cases. A will Be like this. So as you can see, 
it is still independent of the state estimate. However, it does depend on the input readings of IMU. But that's not a problem. These are readings of the IMU that you read directly from the sensor. These are not the state variables that we need to estimate. So depending on what type of filter you're building, you pick the matrix that is appropriate. We will be working with the left invariant EKF this time, so we have to pick the second matrix that I wrote. Now let's add the noise term to readings of the IMU because the perfect model that we discussed obviously does not exist in real world. So now we're going to talk about the noisy process. So for the noisy process, we have the gyroscope readings. So what we read from the gyroscope is some noisy version of the true angular velocity plus some noise. So it is our choice to model the imperfection of the sensor readings with an additive white Gaussian noise. Or you hear additive white Gaussian process because it's a continuous time. We like to call it a process. It's different from that discrete time noise that you use where you write down multivariate normal distribution. For the accelerometer, we have A similar logic, the corrupted noise corrupted readings of the acceleration is some true value plus another noise term. So this is exactly what we talked about. It's an additive wide Gaussian noise. That's at zero mean. It has no autocorrelation. Its continuous time version has a constant power spectrum. So the signal power is constant. That's the meaning of it. In the discrete time version, the covariance that we get is completely determined by the signal at that time. There's nothing new. That's, that's exactly how we built our Kalman filter. Okay. Now we're going to write down the noisy version of the equations of the IMU, which will give you a new insight as well, why we define the noise in that particular way. In the process model, it pops, up, pops out out of the equation naturally. So R dot is rotation now if the true value, right, if the noisy version of 
the signal is the true value plus noise, then the true value that we want to replace in the deterministic case will be the noisy version minus noise. That's why you see the noise is subtracted. But because it's zero mean, it will not have any particular effect if you add it or subtract it. And the covariance is positive anyway. So the reason for subtracting the noise is what I wrote. Now you can distribute the rotation to the angular velocity and the noise. That's, that's like a factored version of it right now. If you have a cross product, right? If you have R cr A cross R B, you can write it as R times A cross B. So it is still simple. It doesn't cause any challenge that we cannot solve. For the position, we don't have noise. We add noise at the source. We do not add noise arbitrarily to the natural relationship that we understand between state variables. The noise is initiated from the source. The source is where, where we read the signals. Namely here, the acceleration and the angular velocity. Now if we put this in to our matrix, we get the noisy or stochastic version of the previous process model that we derived. There is nothing new here. I'm just arranging the equations into a matrix. And I'm separating the part that corresponds to the previously derived deterministic process model and the noise. So we can see what are the different terms we have at the end. And then you can define this to be your previous process model minus the state times a noise term. So that's why in the previous lecture we defined the noise to be the process model plus the state times some noise. Again, plus minus is not very important here because the noise has a zero mean. When we evaluate the state itself during prediction, there is no noise. We just use the process model. Here we also defined a bigger noise vector that includes the gyro noise, accelerometer noise, and zero for the position equation. <laughs> 
So this is also a nine vector, just like our generalized twist. And the matrix you see above, it's the skew version of, is the wedge version of this noise. So we have the noisy process model for the IME as well. We are ready to form the propagation step of the filter. So given an IMU, now you know how to model it. You can integrate and propagate the state. There's a lot more to consider, but you know where to start. But if you have bias stamps, which you definitely have bias in your accelerometer, acceleration readings and gyroscope uh, gyroscopes, angular velocity readings. Those bias stems are very important to correctly estimate and compensate. And they can slowly vary over time. They don't have to be constant because the way you move, the magnitude of the signal, the temperature of the environment, all these factors can cause the bias stems to slowly vary, slowly because relative to the state variables, they're not changing as fast. But they're not completely constant. So we're not gonna drive the biased version. In your homework, you also work with an unbiased model for the gyroscope. But again, in the reference that I will point out, you can see how you can augment the bias, then you have to subtract the bias from this angular velocity and acceleration and also include two more equations for estimating a six vector, three bias terms for the ang angular velocity and three bias terms for the acceleration. And then you will have a bigger A matrix that includes, that considers the error propagation for the bias as well. Now when you include the bias terms, your A matrix is no longer state independent. Unfortunately, when you add the bias, it breaks the symmetry and then you will see rotation and state variables in the matrix. But in practice, it, the filter still works very well. So it's an imperfect invariant filter relative to the ideal case that we derived it, but the performance is still is much better than alternatives. So still, it's the preferred method for state estimation. I have a question about that last part. Can you scroll back up to the thing you're just showing? I'm confused about how this expression can be x dot because it seems like the bottom row is just zero, but it should be v sub t. Your question is how this matrix can be x dot. Yeah. Because x, x is R, V, P, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. So the x dot will be R dot, V dot, P dot, zero, zero. Take the element-wise time derivative. Now R dot is what we have in the above in the equation here. Just substitute them into the X dot, right? And the rest is just left over from noise that we collected into a state matrix times a noise matrix. So this is a little different from last time. I did not tell you that there will be a process model with this structure of noise. We justified the noise modeling from where we read 
gyroscope signals and accelerometer signals. And that led to this structure of the noise, which hopefully will convince you that it's one way to integrate noise into the process model, but it is natural because it's showing up here. So now we want to talk about the left invariant EKF propagation because we want to build a left invariant filter for IMU GPS sensor fusion. And propagation is the same as prediction. I think we discussed this before. So if you remember the left invariant EKF, as I may use the summary in the slide, there is a propagation step, and then there is an update step. If you know A and H, given that we know the process model and the observation model, we, we know everything to implement this filter. So I'm going to talk about the propagation first. And then the one, pro one problem we have to solve is that this is continuous time. We need to discretize it. That needs to be done. And that's a little involved process, but we can do it exactly. If we assume a zero order hold for, uh, the, signal, signal, for the signals, the acceleration and the angular velocity. That means over a delta t sampling time, the constant. Then we can exactly integrate. So we have time derivative of The state evolves based on, the, this, based on this process. So to propagate the state, you just get your state estimate matrix, send it through this process model, and then you have your state at the, at the next step. Not using this, because we have to discretize. But generally, you just use this process model to evolve your mean, mean value for the state matrix. For the covariance, we have this continuous time equivalent of error propagation that I want to talk about it a little bit. Now, where this comes from, it's not necessarily our concern, but I want to give you a quick and convincing proof, maybe, that you feel more comfortable when you see this line. So this is continuous time version of something like this. Phi is the state transition matrix. It's a discretized version of my system matrix. Now, to see why, 
this is a continuous time version of that. A simple logic is to follow these steps. Consider we have a linear, continuous time linear model with additive noise. When you discretize this model, you get something like this time difference equation that will have some transition matrix plus some discrete time noise. And the covariance that we are used to implement in our code evolves using this form from time step k to time step k plus 1. Now we know that from linear systems theory to discretize a continuous time dynamics, essentially we need to integrate. If we integrate that differential equations over a delta t time, we are discretizing. If you can do it exactly, that's perfect. If you can't, then we have to resort to approximation. The most famous approximation is the Euler discretization. We just tell you that approximate a derivative with delta of that variable over delta t, and then see what you get. That's your Euler approximation. For these vector equations, we know that the discretization, based on previous lectures, we know it, it ends up having a matrix exponential. So the discrete time version of the system matrix is the exponential of continuous time state matri uh, system matrix times some delta t. Imagine we do a first order approximation of this. It will be identity plus a t times delta t, which we do. If you cannot exactly derive this, and if the exponential of a matrix is too costly for any reason for you to evaluate it, this is a good approximation. Do we lose something? Of course, we lose a lot. Depending on the application, it could be a good approximation. Now let's substitute this approximation back to the covariance propagation equation. This will give us pk plus 1 equals to identity plus a times delta t times pk times identity plus a t times delta t transpose. And I'm going to say that this is the approximation of the continuous version of Q times delta T. So everything I have here, here is a first order approximation of the continuous time model. Now expand the matrix multiplication. What we will get, we'll get PK plus ATPK times delta t plus pka t transpose times delta t. What I'm going to do, I'm going to drop the second order term. There will be a delta t squared because delta t is assumed to be small. We are after linearization. We drop the second order term that has delta t squared. Then we get qt times delta t. Rearrange this to get pk plus 1 minus pk times delta t. Maybe I write it on the next page. And already recognized the equation. Now, 
as delta t approaches zero, this time difference equation approaches the continuous time evolution because the continuous time equation is an instantaneous version of time difference equation. Then, essentially, if you talk about the limit of the left-hand side, so the limit of this side will be p dot. So p dot time t, then we have to replace everything with p at time t because t approaches zero. It's no longer a delta. Then we derive a special version of a matrix Riccardi equation, which is equivalent of continuous time equivalent of the discrete time covariance propagation. So a lot of time you see this without any particular derivation because it's too famous. But this is one easy way to know where it comes from. The Riccardi equation has more terms, but if you zero out some of them, this is part of it. In Kalman filtering, usually when they say Riccardi equation, they, they mean the propagation and correction together will give you a mat long um, matrix difference, di time difference equation or differential equation that's called Riccardi equation. But this is a version of that too. In control, if this side is zero, it's also called um, the Apanov equation. It has something similar to this structure. All right, in any case, we gave you a reason why I will write it that way. Now I'm going to switch back to the slides. All right, so we talked about the initial measurement unit. We know how to model the noise, and we know how to talk about its continuous time process model. We can write down the noisy process model for the IMU, and we know this model in the, in the deterministic case satisfies the group affine property. But we're not going to go through the integration because you need to just look at it See how it's done in the reference that I will share. What you will get, assuming a zero order hold for the IMU signals, you get the exact integration. So the first term, some new notation, the gamma zero is just the exponential map. Because when you, we write it as power series, then we integrate it. We want to give them new names. We start from gamma zero, and then we call it gamma one, gamma two, as we integrate it. It just naturally shows up when we try to integrate the equations. So there is a gamma one here when we integrate the velocity for the part that is related to rotating the acceleration. For the position, we, we integrate the acceleration twice. There is a gamma two, which is, again, the integration of the exponential map twice. What you used to see, probably not having these terms, however, this shows that the exact integration has some extra term for updating the rotation before you rotate the acceleration vector because the sensor is not just accelerating, it's also rotating. So that rotation, instantaneous angular velocity, will cause the rotation to change. 
So that change is reflect, reflected here in this term. So you can set it to the identity if you like, because often delta t for IMU is very small. So this term will, will be very close to zero. Maybe delta t is a small, and you're not moving super fast. Then it's OK. It's almost identity. But it is interesting to see that the actual model is more complicated. It has coupling of angular velocity and acceleration. So in any case, this is somewhat familiar constant acceleration model, right? Because if you get rid of the rotation and gravity, you know this from physics. Now there's a one half into gamma two, so this will be one half. Okay. So to not be intimidated by these gamma functions, they are given to you in closed form. So you can calculate gamma zero, gamma one, and gamma two. And there is a power series for the general case of M. So gamma zero is simply the exponential map. Gamma one is also called the left Jacobian of SO3. We don't have to use it now. Later in optimization, we, would talk, we talk about log map and Jacobians. But it's Jacobian in the sense we derive that Euler rate matrix. You choose a coordinate, and then there is a matrix that relates the rate of change of angles between two frames based on a particular parameterization. So the name is related to something like that. So we have the discretizations. If you're interested in derivations, I'll share the reference with you. If not, just use it. We are talking about a world-centric state estimator. We track the state with respect to a world frame. If you work with the right invariant, this is the matrix based on the last lecture. We know the noise will have this particular form. In the left invariant, this is the matrix. If you talk about robot-centric state estimator, we have to invert the state. This will flip the correspondences of right and left invariant matrices with the state variable. You can do calculations and you can show them. So now we're ready to talk about an IMU GPS left invariant EKF. So a robot is equipped with an IMU and a global positioning system, which will give you some latitude and longitude in, in the world based on the satellites. It's usually very noisy. You have up to 10 meters error, maybe. Because we have an IMU, it is very natural to talk about the state as an element of SE23 group. For the prediction step, our choice is to use, discretize the IMU model to predict. For the correction step, we want to use the GPS. And then we will see what is the observation model for the GPS. So we're going to model a world-centric left invariant Kalman filter. We know the state matrix. The state transition matrix is the exponential map of A times some sampling time. It turns out that you can calculate this exactly. So the exact discretization of the state transition matrix is also available. And you'll just get a bunch of garbage. If you have bias, there's a lot of terms. You don't want to look at it. You just want to code it and, or find somebody else to code it for you and use it. But it is exact, some integrals you can calculate. And by the way, some of the integrals, you can just use software. If 
It's just the usual integration. You don't have to do it by hand. You can use MATLAB or Mathematica or any symbolic math engine. So the propagation step is out of the way, right? We have the state transition matrix and we can just propagate the covariance. And we have the discretized process model. We can just evaluate the process model to transition the state at time step k to k plus 1. Now, we know that the GPS, after some calculation, we can convert the latitude and longitude to some position. So what we read from the GPS is really the position. When we arrange it into a matrix, because our state is like this, it makes sense to have a vector B to zero out rotation and velocity, and we have zero for the other terms, such that this is what we get. So it's really just the measurement is directly observing the position. When we write it in a matrix form, it gives this form. Then we recognize that this was the left invariant observation model. So based on this definition of the state matrix, it naturally fits into the left invariant observation model. If you invert the state, work with x inverse, it won't be the case, right? Then because then you will have R transpose P in the state. But in any case, that's why we chose to work with the left matrix here. Question is, is the goal here to show that using left a left invariant Kalman filter, we get more accurate measurement? Absolutely not. The filter will not make your measurements more accurate. Well, no, I meant this that statement that is not correct, right? Well, well, no, I meant that the, that, that the, that the IMU data coupled with the GPS uh, produces more accurate. It is a sensor fusion framework, right. We, we want to combine data from multiple sources to make or estimate about some variable better. The minimum we need is usually two, or an assumption and two, like a constant velocity assumption and a sensor. Better to have two sensors. IMU is naturally a good sensor for prediction because we can estimate position, velocity, orientation. GPS is noisy if we can track with IMU and correct with GPS. In an ideal setup, this will work perfectly. But I'll talk about the problems in practice. In your homework, you are using acceleration for correction, gyroscope for propagation. So that should tell you that this is not the only way to look at it. Depending on the problem, we can make different decisions of how to propagate, how to correct. But it's just some sensors are very suitable for propagation, like gyroscopes. Acceleration can be used for both, as, as we see. So the GPS is naturally a left invariant observation model. All we need to do, if you go back to my recipe for the left invariant filter, we need to solve this equation so that we find h. And the way we do it, you just directly calculate. The wedge version of our generalized twist will be this matrix we have here. We know the B matrix. Multiply them, you'll get this vector here. Make this a matrix times 
twist. It ends up being the matrix you see. Get rid of zeros if you wish to work with a reduced version. You can always have a projection matrix to a model to get rid of all the zeros that are redundant. So the Jacobian is constant. It doesn't matter where you are. The corrections are independent of your state estimate, which is nice. So that's, that's the end of this example. You're ready to implement it. Now, if you simulate some data and it's nice, this obviously will work perfectly. In reality, what are the problems? Let's list challenges that you sit down, you want to actually build this filter, and then you will face the list of challenges. Depending on your sensor, the speed. That can be a problem. The interval that we receive signals, maybe the GPS signals are too intermittent. It's, it's not, they're not available on a reliable basis. Now, that's a problem for getting enough correction. But it's not so much of a structural model for the problem for the models, but it is an important problem. Bias, we, we need to include the bias. You can't just integrate between two GPS data, which might come at 10 hertz maybe, or 100 hertz, and I am used at maybe 1,000 hertz. Without bias estimation, it will drift. I assume your GPS and IMU are perfectly co-located. So there might, be, there might be a need for some data processing that your GPS positions are in the frame of your GPS sensor, wherever it's installed on your vehicle. The IMU is probably somewhere else. Now the rule of thumb is that you want to bring in everything into the frame that gives you higher order derivatives. Because to map the linear acceleration to another frame, you will end up needing angular acceleration that we do not have. Whereas to map a posi the position to the IMU frame, we can do it with some rigid body transformation. So your rule of thumb is that your IMU frame is your base frame for a state estimation, or a SLAM, or whatever you do. If there is a difference between where the sensor, the IMU is located and the GPS, we need to know the relative poles. Probably it's rigid, they're not moving. So we need to know the calibration poles. Then you need to map your position measurements to the IMU frame. And then if you do it correctly, then you run this up correction and hopefully it will work. Another problem is tuning the noise covariance might be difficult because the GPS data is very jumpy. It will jump all over the place, but that, whereas IMU likes to track continuously, obviously. So it might work, but it also depends what is your expectation. Are you expecting 10 centimeters accuracy or expecting five meters accuracy? So depending on what are the requirements of your localization, this might be good or not. But it is certainly good for initialization. GPS will tell you where you are. So many questions. Okay. <laughs> you, <laughs> you asked more questions. GPS only corrects the position. It can be well, maybe, maybe it's a, maybe you have a module that gives you velocity as well. But yeah, you can use it if, if that's the case. Oh, you, you don't correct the orientation because there is no measurement for the orientation. 
However, the orientation is correlated with the position and velocity in the process model. When you correct the position, the filter gain, the column and gain will correct all the variables. So that's why it's important that in the process model, the variables must get correlated. If you add a variable and it doesn't get correlated and the observation has got nothing to do with it, you will never correct that variable. Yeah? I think for civilians, GPS is 10, up to 10 meters, something like that. 10 meters accuracy. So, okay, so for military, is more, but we don't have access to that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a meter, maybe. So does that mean that there is a, like, a small enough scale where, at some point, um, in production of such noisy Data is actually hurting your system. Right, right. So you're not, I mean, you're not going to use it indoors, obviously. <laughs> but uh, maybe on highway, uh, you are also, I don't know, if you go to Hong Kong or New York, Manhattan, you just, you go wrong to the wrong direction if you use GPS. It's always wrong, right? Because you have this multipathing and shadowing and whatnot from the, signals that your phone receives, it's not reliable. So there is a place probably this is useful. It's not completely useless. For, I think for airplanes, probably it's good. It works well probably for aerial applications. For cars, it's not enough. For ground vehicles, this is not enough. But just an example. Now, one question to answer before we finish is that if you have left and right filters, can you convert halfway through the calculations? Yes, you can. Using the adjoint, you can map the left invariant error to the right invariant. Therefore, you can have a relationship between your left invariant and right invariant covariance. So you can always map them. Now, if you don't have bias and nonlinearity that makes the filter depends on the state, this is exact. If you do have bias because you do depend on the state estimate, it's imperfect, but it's possible to map. For example, you want to do right invariant correction, then you want to do left invariant correction. You can do that. And then you want to go back to the maybe right invariant. So that's also possible, and the adjoint will help us to do that. So some process models naturally evolve on Lie groups. And this filter is an error state Kalman filter on Lie group and is naturally suitable for those problems. Despite the fact we violate all the theoretical results for noise and bias um, addition, it works very well in practice. This is the preferred method. It has excellent consistency. You don't get the spurious correlation across different coordinates. This is something that in other version, versions of Kalman filter you get. A spurious correlation can make your unobservable state observable, and that's very undesirable, because the filter becomes overconfident of, uh, over something that is not supposed to be observable. 